say amen again. Amen. I'm so glad God ran to us, even in our darkest hour and at our worst time, he ran to us. Praise the Lord. So I'm just going to, this isn't long, but I want to give a final charge um, to those who are graduating. We've been, I've been kind of hitting a few lessons as we go on through the, through the weekend. Um, but for this one, if you have your Bible, you can turn to Matthew chapter 8, and then we're going to go to Luke chapter 12. Um, Matthew chapter 8, and then we're going to go to Luke chapter 12. In Matthew chapter 8, in verse 36 and 37, the Bible says this, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So our talk for this evening is entitled, The Gain of Wisdom. The gain of wisdom. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to give a word of encouragement, a word of advice, Lord, even a word of celebration to those who will be finishing, who have finished their course of work here and studies and will be moving on. I ask for you to speak now. You give them the words you want to hear, Father, so they will leave this place blessed prepared for what is next. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. So if you have your Bible, we're going to go to Luke chapter 12. Our church, for prayer meeting, I've been marching through the book Christ Object Lesson, Lessons, and um, every, I, I get so many good sermons out of it. It's really a good book. Um, but the, of course, the book is only as good as understanding or its purpose, I should say, is to understand the parables of Jesus. So Luke chapter 12, verse 13, says, And one of the company said unto him, and this is from the great multitude that was following him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. We're told in the spirit of prophecy that when this gentleman heard Jesus speak, how convincing he was, he, this man was in a battle with his brother after his father or parents had died, and there was an argument, as in the Jewish uh, tradition at the time, the eldest son got twice what every other son got. And somehow this son was probably one of the younger sons who felt he did not get what he was supposed to get. And so he heard Jesus speak and saw how powerfully he proclaimed things. And he thought to himself, maybe if Jesus speaks to my brother, I can get my inheritance all sorted out. Jesus' response in verse 14 is actually quite priceless. And he said unto him, man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? Very interesting. Jesus said, listen, this, you know, my job on earth isn't to sort these types of things out. Who, who, who determined that I was the one who should figure this out? Then he says in verse 15, and he said unto them, speaking to the whole crowd and his disciples, take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. He steps back and Jesus now realizes that this gives them a moment to do some teaching. Here brothers are fighting and arguing over what they have or what they possess or what they didn't get in an inheritance. And he stopped, Jesus stops and he steps back and he looks at the crowd and he says, listen, be careful, take heed. Be, care of, be careful for wanting what everyone else has. That's covetousness. Because your life consists not in how much stuff you own. In our society here in America, we have become quite materialistic. Um, and it's easy to be materialistic in America. I mean, I've gone into um, government housing, and they've had big screen TVs and Blu-ray DVD players, um, and the kids have uh, sneakers I, I don't think I could afford to buy. Not difficult to be materialistic. 
But when you finish a program like this, you step into a world. And let me tell you something. There's nothing wrong with having. The Bible is full of people who had plenty. Abraham was quite wealthy. Joseph obviously became quite wealthy. David, Solomon, uh, um, Nicodemus. I go through the Bible. It's not that having stuff is bad. It's whether or not the stuff has you. Ella White says it like this. She says, in Christ Object Lesson, page 254, in Christ's treatment of this case is a lesson for all who will minister in his name. And you all are leaving here to minister in his name. When he sent forth the 12, he said, as ye go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely ye have received, freely give. Matthew 10, 7 and 8. They were not to settle the temporal affairs of the people. Their work was to persuade men to be reconciled to God. In this work lay their power to bless humanity. Now there's two points I want you to get from what, what we just read. The first one is that as you've come here and you've experienced uh, your time at Wildwood, I want you to understand you have, been, they have, you have, been, you have received freely. It has been given to you freely. You have learned things that many don't know. You've, you've interacted with people in a way. Even the times you've spent going door to door and meeting people. Let me tell you something. There are sales teams all across the country for big corporations that wish they had people with your courage. It's easy to, walk, it's easy to be a salesman and go into somebody else's office and, and you know, they own a farm and say, listen, I got a tractor to sell you. You don't have to worry they're going to run you out of there or laugh at you for trying to sell a farmer a tractor. Or going into a, a, a meeting, a, a friend, a, a, a Chef Chu, one of my good friends, owns a, vegeta a, a vegan uh, meat substitute product and he goes before Target and Walmart. You're not worried you're going to get run out of those places selling them something that might make them money. But when you walk up to someone's door and you knock and there's nothing you're giving them that is going to give them earthly gain, that takes a special level, level of courage. Because you know that in this society and in this time, even down here in Georgia, and somebody, when I was going through my thing with Georgia, one of the state senators said, this is Georgia. This isn't just the Bible Belt. He said, Georgia's the buckle of the Bible Belt. <laughs> even in the buckle of the Bible Belt, there are now folk who will run you off their property for bringing up the name Jesus. You have been given, and you, some of you have no idea how priceless what you've gained is. You'll see it as, you, as God brings you into where you're supposed to be. You'll see that you have been given all you need for God to succeed, successfully use you in this life. The second warning given here in the, by the inspired pen is this one, that we are not to settle the temporal affairs of the, of the people. Uh, their work was to persuade men to be reconciled to God in this work lay their power to bless humanity. And as we enter the silly season of the presidential election and all of the politics, I want you to remember our goal as Christians is not to settle the, the temporal affairs of the world or of this people or of even the nation, the United States. Black people, it is not your job to try and fix and remedy all that has ever gone wrong for black people. If you get caught up in that, you'll miss actually presenting to the people what will solve problems. And that is that the people be reconciled to God. The reason I, I have no doubt that Black Lives Matter will never be what they want to be is because their mission is not to reconcile people to God. The same reason the Christian nationalists that have popped up in the country and patriotism, it won't work. We, when you leave this place, be careful what you give allegiance to and what causes you, su you support because your primary role is to bring people back in relationship with God. The song that was sung before I got up here is the perfect song. God is looking for a world that has people in it who will run, or who will make one step towards him and God will go running towards them. But she says something else. She says, the only remedy for the sins and sorrow of men is what? It's Christ. Let me tell you something. We talk about medicine. We talk about health evangelism. We talk about nursing and physical. We talk about other things. Let me tell you something. At the end of the day, the root cause of all pain, sorrow, disease, and death in this world is sin. And there's one anecdote 
one medication, one treatment for sin, and that is the blood of Jesus Christ. It says, she says, the gospel of his grace alone can cure the evils that curse society, the injustice of the rich toward the poor, the hatred of the poor toward the rich, alike have their root in selfishness. And this can be eradicated only through submission to Christ. He alone, for the selfish heart of sin, gives the new heart of love. Let the servants of Christ preach the gospel with the spirit sent down from heaven and work as he did for the benefit of men. Do you see that? Let me tell you something. When we, when we were going over this, this in prayer meeting, um, there was some, you know, I, I, we were having the discussion and historically I, I can remember all the way back, you know, having these discussions all the way back at Oakwood. And there are some who would say, basically, you know, if you get rich, you've sinned just by, be, by virtue of being rich. And I said, listen, I grew up poor. There's a whole lot of mess and sin that happens because you're poor too. You spend a lot of time wishing you had what somebody else has. But it is only in Christ that the rich will not be owned by their possessions and only in Christ that the poor will not be uh, 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 vindictive, angry, or, or covetous in their poverty. It is only in Christ that you will learn, no matter what state you find yourself in, to be content, as the Apostle Paul says. So when you leave here, unlike other schools, see, if, if, if this was a graduation at UC Berkeley or Yale up in, in Connecticut where I live or Harvard or, or Princeton or someplace, I would, you know, my chant would be how you can go out and succeed in this life, make a name for yourself, make as much money as you want, uh, as you can. That's what most of these schools want their alumni to, to go out and do. I am not hoping you do that. I hope life goes well and God takes good care of you. But you have been called, especially called, to go into a dying world and introduce them to the living Christ. That may, you may do well in your career and, and have. You may not. But if you do what God says do, whatever happens in this life will only be a test for the reward you will receive in the next one. She finishes this passage in Christ Object Lesson, page 254. Ellen White says this. Then such results will manifest in the blessing and uplifting of mankind as are wholly impossible of accomplishment by human power. Let me tell you something. If only politics could do what they promised. They can't do it. The truth of the, we're talking about this at lunch, the truth of the matter is we live in a country where lobbyists probably make more decisions for us than the people we elect. You look at the quality of something as simple as the food in America and you realize somebody has to be messing with something for them to allow the population to eat things or drink aspartame or eat genetically modified food without even warning them. If you think people are going to solve the problem, the evidence that people will not solve the problem not only lie in what's going on in the world today, here in America and around the world, it lies in even the conflicts of the last century, the First and Second World War. When the First World War was over, they said this is the war to end all wars. Man had figured it out. They formed a League of Nations. This will never happen again. It wasn't a full generation before the Second World War came and even more people died and even more of the world was infected by battles and war. If you're hoping people will solve the problem, you're in trouble. But instead, God gives light to a precious few. And we are to take the good news of Jesus Christ to a world that suffers and let them know that God has not forgotten them. That in fact, there is a God who sits high and looks low. The parable goes like this, Luke chapter 12 and verse 16. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? So this guy put up a farm. And his farm did very well. I mean, everything he planted grew nicely. He had big cucumbers and watermelons. There was grapes on all of his vines. He was doing well. And it just kept growing and growing. Uh, I'm sure he learned how to can or something because he was ready to save all of this fruit. And so he said, what am I going to do with all of this fruit that's growing? He didn't think about anybody else, did he? Instead, in verse 18, he said, this will I do. 
I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will bestow all my fruits and my goods. Verse 19, and I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. The guy says, I tell you what I'm going to do with all this leftover stuff I've got. I'm going to store it and retire. And after that, I'm just going to live the good life. We as Christians, and not, this goes beyond just the, those graduating now, we have been given good fruit. We've been given the good fruit of the gospel, the spirit of prophecy, end time truth and prophecies. All of this we've been given. We've been given all this good fruit. If we say, I'm just going to collect all this good fruit, I'm going to sit back and in, 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 in a sense of salvific security, I will simply attend church as I ought to and live out the rest of my days, we fool ourselves. When a man decided he was going to tear down his barns and build bigger ones to store his stuff, here's how God responded in the parable. But God said unto him, you fool. This night your soul shall be required of you. Then whose shall those things be which you have provided? You fool. You're saving up for a life you don't even have. Because tonight, before you tear down the barns, before you store the stuff, tonight your life will be required of you. And I like what he says, and who shall those things be which thou hast provided? My cousin Sean Taylor was drafted number five overall in the NFL draft to the Washington Redskins. He signed a $36 million contract. Raised Adventist, he was a pathfinder, sang in the choir. Um, he was one of the best safeties the NFL has ever known. If you Google and look him up, you'll see it. My grandmother was a very faithful Christian Jamaican lady. Um, she helped start her church in Betheltown, Jamaica, many decades ago. And she raised all of us to know God. Long story short, my cousin Sean was injured and went home instead of going back with the team to Virginia after a game in Tampa Bay. And he went home and someone broke into his house. And when he had his girlfriend and the baby there with him, and the guy broke in and shot Sean in his leg, ruptured his femoral artery, and he bled. And a few days later, he died. $36 million contract, number five in the NFL draft. His uh, agent is the same agent that they made the movie Jerry Maguire after. All of that fame, all of that money, and somebody else will spend it. Because when we went to the funeral, and when we were going to that cemetery, there was no U-Haul hooked up to his hurts. The fishing boat was not attached to the back. His mansion, they didn't drag it, take it in part, and put it in the grave. His BMW still sat in the garage. We can make all this money in this world, but we have to be very careful. Because God said to him, whose shall those things be which you have provided? The goal of leaving here, it, it, again, it's not a, that you can't go out and do well in this life. It's that you've got to be careful that the things you go after hold you in a place where you don't do what God wants you to do. Look at what God says, or what Jesus says in the parable in verse 21. So is he that lays up treasure for himself, and I like the last part of this, and is not rich toward God. The parable doesn't say that the problem was that he, that, he, that he had treasure. The problem is that his treasure caused him to not be rich toward God. Ellen White says it like this. This man's aims were no higher than those of the beasts that perish. He lived, he lived as if there were no God, no heaven, no future life, as if everything he possessed were his own, and he owed nothing to God or man. The psalmist described this rich man when he wrote, the fool said in his heart, there is no God. To live for self is to perish. Covetousness, the desire of benefit for self's sake, cuts the soul off from life. It is the spirit, it is the spirit of Satan to get, to draw to self. It is the spirit of Christ to give, to sacrifice self for the good of others. And this is the record that God has given us eternal life. 
and this life is in his son. He that has the son has life. And he that does not have the son of God hath not life. The only thing we get to leave this earth with is our character. And I would argue that that character is a representation of our relationship with God. That's all you get to take with you. I wish you, I could, you, you, you could somehow have a bank account that, that lasted past death, but it doesn't exist. Solomon in all of his glory died and left it. And he says this, Wherefore, he says, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. Instead, you want to be rich toward God, meaning that you have a relationship with him where you have bought the gold tried in the fire. The gold that comes from stepping out of your safety zone and walking to up to people's houses you don't know to introduce them to a Jesus they don't know. The goal that comes from the, 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 the trial of not necessarily following the path that everyone else does, listening to the word of God and going in the direction he says. The goal that comes from that trial, that's what makes you rich toward God when you've been humbled and the character purified so that you know him for yourself. Before my wife and Janae come up to sing, I want to just end by finishing the story with this piece. When my, after my cousin Sean was shot, he went to uh, the Ryder Trauma Center attached to Jackson Memorial Hospital in Miami where I did medical school and, um, and, my, and my, um, even did my trauma ro surgery rotation at that hospital, Ryder Trauma Center. He got there and they gave him $60,000 worth of albumin to try and keep the blood in his veins. I talked to his father later on. His father, Pete, was the chief of police for Florida City, Florida. Uh, he said that he believed that all of Sean's blood had bled out at the house. They airlifted him to the hospital. They gave him the albumin. They were working to save him. He had stabilized, and he was, he was left in the operating suite. My Jamaican grandmother, Alga Clark, she was able to go in and sit by his side, and as she sat there, she kept humming things and whispering things. My brother said he could just see her doing all of that uh, 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 in his ear. A day or two went by. Nothing seemed to change. And finally, as my grandmother, who was refusing to go home and shower and come back, she didn't eat much of anything for the time that she was sitting there with him. CNN was outside. ESPN was outside. All the cameras trying to figure out how he was doing, what had happened. All of the rumors started swirling. But my grandmother faithfully just sat there. She was the health evangelist in this situation. Finally, my brother says that as they were in there, the doctor and the nurse walk in. The doctor says, Sean, if you can hear me, blink your eye. And he blinks. And the doctor says, Sean, if you can hear me, squeeze her hand. And the nurse puts the hand out and he squeezes her hand. The nurse looks at the doctor. The doctor looks at the nurse. He kind of shrugs his shoulder. He walks back out. At that point, my grandmother, who had been humming and singing and whispering all that time, gets up and tells my brother, okay, I'm ready to go take a shower. My brother says, wait a minute, now? It seems like something good's going to happen. No, 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 now. I'm ready to go take a shower. I need to get ready. So she takes off back to her house in Homestead, Florida, and drive from, my, from downtown Miami all the way down to Homestead, Florida, and she starts to shower and bathe. ESPN, CNN starts saying, hey, Sean Taylor responded. It looks like he might live. He might turn it around. I was at Loma Linda working at the time, and I, I talked to my brother. I said, this is what they're saying on news, the truth. He said, I don't know how they could be saying that. He looks terrible in there. Within 24 or 48 hours, Sean died. I flew from L.A. out to Miami, and I, I made a beeline to my grandmother. And I asked her, I said, Mama, why, when it seemed like the miracle was about to happen, you left? She said, that's not what happened. She said, I had been whispering in his ear the Bible verses and the Sabbath school lessons I taught him when he was a child. I was singing him the songs I sang him as a child to get him to know and love Jesus. I was telling him the lessons of the cross and of Christ. I was, I was trying to, to witness to him on his deathbed. She said, but I began to get tired. I began to get uh, weak. And I said, Lord, let me know that he can hear me. 
She said when she made that prayer, the doctor and the nurse walked in. And she realized her work was done. Well, let me tell you something. I don't know how it ends for my cousin, Sean. But I won't find out if it wound up good for him unless I make it into the kingdom myself. The work my grandmother did that two or three days is the work you're called to do. It is the work to go in and reach a dying world and give them the last vestige of hope before time runs out. One day on the celestial plane, as we stand on the sea of glass, there will be those who will be there because God put the work on you and in you to finish spreading the gospel around the world. That's how serious it is. One day on the verge of eternity, God will show you just how powerful what you've learned is and how much impact you've had. And it starts today. We serve a wonderful, merciful Savior. And as they come to sing, I want us to remember that that wonderful, merciful Savior wants all of us involved in this work.
Thank you.